Hello, my name is Karen Rundlett and I'm a journalism director at the Knight Foundation. Thanks so much for spending the time with us. Election night. Um, it is usually a very, very late one in American news newsrooms. Journalists double and triple check data and results. They craft headlines, they conduct interviews, they shoot video and photos, and they produce live reports from candidates' campaign headquarters. The one thing they can usually count on is free pizza and lots of coffee, but the pandemic of 2020 with remote work, even that's changed. Everything has changed. The pandemic has changed how we vote and it's expected to change how long it takes to count those votes. So today we're asking the question, could election night end up becoming election week or election month? And really how do journalists prepare for that? Our guests today are Josh Yuri. Josh worked as a senior producer at both CBS News and ABC News, serving hundreds of affiliate stations. And now Josh is a news director at a Scripps owned station in Waco, Texas, KXXV TV. Hi, Josh. Hello, glad to be here. Great to have you. Um, and also, we have Frank Munjum. Um, Frank is actually the newly named Chief, of Inno Chief Innovation Officer at the Local Media Association. Congrats, Frank. Thank you, Karen. Um, and he is uh, still wrapping up things um, at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. Um, he is the Knight Professor of Practice in TV Innovation. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. All right, let's get to it. Um, Josh, I just want to start with you. Journalists watch this program, but non-journalists watch as well. So why don't you just level set? Um, there are a lot, a lot of folks who just want to know what a newsroom's election night looks like generally. Yeah, you alluded to it. Uh, it starts off with a lot of pizza and coffee, um, <laughs> but then <laughs> we get down to business and that is covering the races uh, from a local microcosm to make sure that the local community is informed on what's happening here locally. Okay, but that's changed. Um, at, but the thing about the pandemic, it's really shown us the power of local leadership. We have, you know, governors and mayors not agreeing in some instances, not agreeing with what the federal um, laws. There is really a battle for control you know, on how to really address the pa pandemic. So tell me a little bit about, you're in Waco. Um, that looks like Paris to me in the background though. Is it that is, Paris? Yes, okay. it is. It is Paris, okay. but here in Waco, let me just set the scene. So, you know, the governor uh, will, you know, when it pertains to the pandemic, he may come out with an executive order, but the governor here in Texas leaves it up to the judges. The judges actually set policy for mandating mask wearing and what have you. So while the governor may want to do one thing, it's really up to the local county judges uh, to enforce rules. Okay, that's, that, that's you know, loop, local nuance that's so important for us to know. Um, so um, I'm gonna ask Frank this question. Frank, what's really most different about covering th this year's election locally? Um, and, and, and frankly, what might not need to be in the election plan? And, and then Josh, I wanna hear from you. So what's most different about covering this, this year's election locally, Frank? I've worked in local TV newsrooms for most of my career. And frankly, uh, the coverage plan usually is about logistics and races, you know, each of the headquarters and uh, horse racing that night of who's ahead, who's behind. And those are not the problems to be solved this year. Overwhelmingly, the, the, the question and the challenge this year is about the integrity of the vote itself and all of the things leading up to that, meaning are all the eligible voters going to be able to vote and will all of the fairly cast votes be counted? Okay, and and I, go I, ahead. Agree, I agree with Frank. You know, there was an analysis not too long ago by NPR that says over five, half a million votes were rejected uh, in the primary because the ballots were filled out incorrectly. And so in the local newsroom, what we want to do is educate voters on how to make sure your vote is counted. And so we are actually taking the steps now in our coverage to tell voters how to properly fill out ballots to make sure the votes are counted. Okay, okay, that's wonderful. Um, so um, Frank, you also wrote an article and it was um, one of the most popular articles on the Knight Cronkite Lab uh, 
a newsletter and website. Um, and it was, it was, you know, um, it, it may not be election night. It may not, it may be election week or maybe even election month. So how or what else do reporters, executive producers and editors really need to do to change their plans? Yeah, the first thing is start now. I mean, in my experience in local newsrooms, often there are planning meetings now, but the real coverage plan often doesn't kick in until October. That's too late. So the way to have every vote counted and integrity in the elections is to begin coverage now. Josh's example is a great one. In your state, how can you be reporting right now uh, for your voters on what do they need to do to get a mail-in ballot? What should they do to be sure the mail-in ballot gets received? Uh, how can we be sure that both polling places and vote counting locations are properly staffed? But then the second half is setting expectations up to and including what's your promotion department doing in terms of messaging your coverage. I mean, forever I've been part of election night X thousand, you know, and the, 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 the shiny promo that, that makes viewers and consumers think there'll be a satisfying ending tonight. So preparing audiences now by doing stories with state and local election officials on how long will it take to count the ballots? How, how many more votes are expected? What is a reasonable expectation for when results could, could be uh, fully tabulated? So messaging internally in the newsroom that it's not like election yeah. night pizza and we're done, but also to the audience now to set the expectation that to do this right, it could take a while. Josh, have you, how have you already started to do some of that work or what, what are you sort of looking at in your plan? Yeah, so one of the things that we really want to do this year, uh, we want to make sure that we have experts on hand to mm -hmm. talk about these issues, whether it's COVID-19 mm -hmm. or whether it's the election system itself within, as it pertains to the Electoral College. And there are so many different issues that will, that will impact decisions at the polls, whether it's you know, George Floyd or defunding police. So we want to get the experts now uh, and have them available to have that conversation to provide context to our viewers. And Karen, can I add to that? Because Josh is making a great point. So we've always had the pundit panels. The question is, is the pundit panel used, used in the past going to work this time? And my answer is absolutely not. So Josh has given an example of, of actually what do we need to be doing now to find the right kinds of experts for the unique nature of this election. And so some of the, the example Josh gave, like if you're in Texas, the judges versus the governor, that's right. going to be a state by state issue with a different answer depending on the state you're in. So one of the things we actually need on our local pundit panels now is that constitutional law expert as opposed to the party political pundit who, who tell you why people are feeling this way or that. We actually need to understand the law and how state procedural uh, regulations will be applied. Those are a different kind of expert and you can't wait till election night to go find them. Right. If you wait till election night, you, you've missed the conversation. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Um, so I, you know, television newsrooms um, and election night is a story that has, brings like an exhilaration to it and a celebration. There's gonna be a winner at the end there. You know, there's a party with a crowd and cheering and champagne bottles and, um, and, and th there's just some natural drama to that. And that's not gonna happen this time. So. How are, tell me a little bit more, Josh, about how the newsroom culture is sort of prepared for, you know, uncertainty and delay, frankly. This is not going to be a certain, a certain winner necessarily. Yeah. yeah, you know, this, you know, as, as, as we talked about, this could play out for days beyond election night. And so it's really important to have your crews uh, tap into your state election offices. Uh, to have someone that you can call to follow, whether it's on social media, but to have these conversations now, because we know inevitably what's going to happen. We're not going to have clear winners possibly on election night. And so what we have to do in newsrooms is be able to keep the conversation going as, as, as the votes come in. The one thing I, I don't want to see happen this year is, you know, this notion we got to be first and then a newsroom makes a mistake and come out with results only to walk it back later. 
uh, because as we know, there's already this notion that uh, the fake media, right? And so we have to take uh, extra precautions to ensure that we aren't, um, you know, providing information to that narrative. So you've actually had a conversation with reporters where you're talking about it's it's you you've really had a conversation about it's not as important to be first as it, as it is correct and oh, right absolutely. And absolutely and that's just not a, with the election that's just across the board uh, it, I'd rather be right than first excellent excellent um, so uh, you know we we started to talk about it. Um, um, and uh, in July of this year, Neiman Lab reported on the growth of partisan media, all these websites popping up and sort of masquerading as state and local news organizations, and they're not. Um, and some of them are actually spreading misinformation. So um, Frank, I'd like to hear from you. How are journalists, how are they able to really fight the spread of misinformation, especially in this election? There's a lot at stake. Yeah, I mean, I do think this is the most challenging election I've been through in that regard. Uh, and so fact checking falsehoods that are being widely spread on social media becomes a mandatory part of an overall local coverage plan. Um, and I do think so first draft does training for journalists that is worth considering if, if a newsroom hasn't uh, had that training. But but really part of the nuance is you don't want to give oxygen to rumors and, and help amplify falsehoods. So it really takes discipline to identify when a, a rumor has reached a level of exposure that it's important to knock it down. Otherwise, actually, we are using our pulpit to amplify and what people may hear is actually the <laughs> falsehood, not the, the, the fact check. And so it's, it's not as easy as just fact check false things. It's also a threshold for, you, if, you, if you try to chase down every falsehood, you're in a constantly reactive mode. And frankly, then the misinformation strategy winds up working. And so there's a discipline to really set the bar to misinformation that's reaching a, a, a level of distribution where it's important to knock it down while not handing over the editorial process to those who would try to undercut the election. So there, there's an amount of proactivity where we want to be sure back to kind of Josh's earlier point, we're putting our limited local news resources also uh, for and toward uh, how can you be sure that you uh, have a valid registration? How can you be sure your ballot gets received? How can you be sure your ballot gets counted? Great. Um, uh, Josh, I'd love to hear a little bit more. What is the concern? Um, how are you tackling the concern in the newsroom that perhaps reporters could be, could sort of fall prey to misinformation? What, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more practically about that. Yeah, so you know there there are different layers in the newsroom of uh, making sure that we have facts, right? We do a two source system uh, mm -hmm. where it has to be vetted at least by two sources uh, before that information is included in a script. And typically, mm -hmm. it's it's the higher up managers in the newsroom that signs off, whether it's an EP or you know, the assistant news director or myself uh, who will sign off on a script before it, it makes air just to make sure that we are vetting the content. Mm -hmm. And 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 EP, of course, is an executive producer. Executive producer, yes. Yeah, yeah. I just want to mention that for the non-journalists, um, the non-reporters and non-TV types. Um, so, um, so um, also, um, Josh, uh, a little bit about Waco. I, I believe it has 21% um, African-American population, 32% Hispanic Latinx, there's a smaller Asian and Native American community. Um, how are you working to, um, how are you thinking about the coverage to serve those communities? Well, I've been fortunate enough uh, since I arrived here in Waco uh, nearly a year ago to really diversify my newsroom staff. And I think that's really a critical component of being reflective of the community with you serve. Uh, and so we've hired you know, uh, Latinos and African Americans when we have openings to make sure they are in the community uh, and, and bringing forth the content that matters to those communities. 
Okay, excellent. Um, Frank, Karen, if I can um, just add to that, there's a, you know, one of, I think, the most important stories that, that local newsrooms can be working on right now, you know, and I do recommend uh, in the article, I talk about a now, next, later <laughs> approach, you know, what are the things that should be done right now in local newsrooms? And, you know, Josh touched on it, right? If you, I, I'm very interested in local reporting on how representative our polling place is polling place distribution relative to population. You know, we've seen examples in Georgia, for example, that are just outrageous, where polling places have been closed down, but not in a neutral kind of way. And so that's the kind of uncover, discover accountability reporting that local newsrooms can and should be the leader on to, be, to find out where the polling places are, which ones have been closed, and is there anything about that that is unequal in the distribution? And then we've seen literally just in the last two weeks, the whole USPS mailbox removal uh, news. Again, I would be looking at where are those mailboxes being removed, overlaid against my communities. And again, is there unequal access to exercising the right to vote? Excellent. Yeah, because because what you want to do is you want to make sure in those communities where, you know, for example, here in Texas, we had a district that uh, the voting machines left to rot and they're not working anymore. Okay, so what are those people going to do when it comes time to vote? And so we went to that community and asked the, the officials, what are you doing to make sure these folks aren't disenfranchised, right? So we yeah. you got to put pressure. When you find these situations, local newsrooms, you have to put pressure on these officials to make sure they're going to do the right thing for their voters. I love that point by Josh, right, and Karen? So we've actually seen this at the national level on, on some of the postal service issues, which again, I would point out, were first identified in local newsrooms and that reporting became scaled. So if we ever had any doubt about the importance of local journalism, right? So those things got found at the local level led to scaled pressure, which led to rollbacks of some of those uh, policies. So the, right. the importance right now of local accountability journalism is huge. The other thing kind of along, along is what Josh is talking about is I'll, I'll admit that I, and I've worked in journalism for decades, I had never heard of a provisional ballot until the last nine months. So there's, and I, you know, being in Arizona, I have seen how in what seems to be a very unequal way, um, certain voters have been challenged at the point of the polling place on whether right. they're eligible to vote. And so educating right now, we can be putting in little explainer videos on how, how and why to ask for and request and require that you receive a provisional ballot if you have trouble right casting your vote. These are the kinds of things we can be working on in our local newsrooms right now right. that educate our voters, empower them, and ensure that their voice will be heard. Great. Um, thank you. Um, we do, um, we welcome questions from the audience. We have a couple of questions and comments coming in. Um, Melissa has um, asked a little bit about um, the, the idea, Josh, that you were speaking about, and, and Frank as well, the constitutional law expert, um, what kinds of non-traditional, what other kinds of non-traditional experts might we be thinking of? She wants to know a little bit about finding these experts and what we might consider, and, and the right I, questions to ask in your community. I think one uh, voting block that's gonna be huge this year is the youth vote and really tapping into the different organizations that support that demographic uh, to find out more about the issues that are near and dear to them. Uh, those are the experts that I would be tapping into, uh, especially knowing that they will play a significant role in this election. Absolutely, Frank, your thoughts there. Yeah, As I mean- the, the, the professor at a, a university. <laughs> well, I mean, I- uh, <laughs> I actually, my thoughts were more on, you know, the different kinds of experts that we, we need okay. to be looking for. Okay. Um, and, you know, I feel like we have all had the luxury of living 
in an America where we didn't actually as citizens need to know how the soup got stirred. Um, and all of a sudden this year, we need a granular understanding, which is different state by state, which again is where local journalists come in on, well, what is the procedure for counting mail-in ballots versus counting ballots at, collected at a polling place? And then who in the state has the authority under state statute to declare the winner? And how, who has the power to assign delegates? You know, I mean, yeah. again, I think in the last few years, we've all gone to school uh, in terms of the electoral college versus the popular vote. I mean, that for many people four years ago was uh, rather a shocking aha moment. So I think there's, there's a level of granularity that we all didn't, think we needed to know in the past that this year we do need to know to ensure a, an outcome we trust. Yeah, I agree. That constitutional law that Frank mentioned earlier is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. Those experts are going to be able to answer a lot of questions, uh, election night and thereafter. Um, thank you. I have a question from Peg and she is asking either one of you whoever wants to raise their hand on this, um, any special um, guidance for student journalists, um, what to look for on their campuses, um, um, how to inform their readers about fact checking with social media. Either of you want to take that? Anybody want to? I, I do feel obliged, Professor Frank. I was one last shot, one <laughs> last right. chance to answer as Professor Frank. <laughs> um, you know, and I'll, I'll broaden it, right? You know, this is uh, an opportunity to realize the potential of true community-based reporting, right? And so if we all, if the most fundamental aspect of democracy is, is our participation through voting in our, in who, who leads us, then not just involving student journalists, but activating the community at large. And one of the links that went through in the chat with Election SOS is really all about engaging with communities. So I think not just for student journalists, I don't know, at ASU, two years ago at the midterms, the students of Cronkite News did an amazing job fanning out because the student newsroom sometimes these days is bigger than another local newsroom, has the resources to fan out and physically be present at polling places. And so one of the ways that I think will be, one of the things that will be a huge determinant of the ultimate question, which is do we collectively trust the outcome of our election is genuinely neutral monitoring of the voting experience at voting uh, at polling places. And so student journalists are, are a fantastic team to activate. And also that's a conversation again, that Josh talking about, you know, what could we in our local newsers be doing now, we could be bringing our audience into that conversation and activating the community to help not just observe, but I think we have a huge staffing problem. I mean, I know I'm going along here, but experts have pointed out, this is really the first time we've ever had, in effect, a double election. We have a polling election and a mail-in ballot election, right. each of which those need to be counted, right? At the same time that we have a pandemic. And so let's be honest, the folks who have always blessed their heart, volunteered at polling booths, tend to be older oh, Americans right. who are rightly concerned about COVID because they're at the highest risk. So we've already seen in the primaries, you have a, a drop in volunteers at right. polling places, even Lord. as you have a demand that we expect to be huge to vote. And so again, so this is beyond student journalists, but there is an opportunity right now for local newsrooms to help activate their communities to fill these needs that are part of ensuring uh, trustworthy elections, which is the volunteerism component sure. of being at polling places, helping count ballots. Agreed. Yeah. I just want to mention too, just um, I am in Miami-Dade County and, um, you know, um, engagement was so much higher. Voter, voter turnout for the primary was the highest it's been since 2004. So there is a more, there was a, a more engaged Miami-Dade County and we've had countless uh, night studies that have shown that people who watch the news and consume journalism tend to vote more. Um, so, um, you know, Josh, if you would tell me a little bit about, like, where is the audience? Are they, are they 
engaging with you on social media? I mean, television is, is do you have a larger audience now? How has it changed in the pandemic? Yeah, you know, for, for us, we've, we've done pretty well. Um, you know, there, there was this notion that viewers weren't watching as much in the mornings, but for us, we still see a lot of engagement in our morning show and in the afternoons, but we also see a huge uptick in online in our digital um, space. Okay. So yeah, very a lot of uh, people are consuming our content uh, digitally. And so I think, you know, moving forward, as people shift back, we get a vaccine and people shift back to their, um, you know, their normal routines, the stations who've done it well, in terms of their digital space, mirroring what they see on broadcast, I don't see uh, folks losing their audience, maybe possibly gaining more of an audience. I mean, that's so important to, to note that television is um, providing information on websites, on social and streaming. And, um, you know, it, it, it's not just like, it's not your, you know, it's not your grandmother's five o'clock newscast in the living room. So, um, okay, a couple of other questions um, from William. William is um, very direct and is talking about President Trump already trying to, um, you know, um, raise some doubt about the results of the presidential election. Um, that is a national story, but we, it, 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 there's no doubt that we're increasingly a partisan nation. Uh, how do you think, um, he asks, um, how can election night reporting um, help reassure voters, regardless of party, that the election is in fact fair? I'll take a stab at it, and, and it's All a right, great question. Mm -hmm. And my first answer is by not waiting till election night to start at work. And so what we've been saying about communicating, you know, uncover and discover what is the process in your state for counting votes and how will you exercise your duty as a local journalism organization to be a monitor and a watchdog of that? How can we, as a member of our communities, preemptively problem solve around activating volunteerism so the issues aren't staffing related? And then the last thing I would say is we actually have to build in an extra decision step before we just automatically report what people in power say. And mm -hmm. that step is we have to ask the question, what interests are being served by this claim? So the Postal Service to me is a perfect example of this. And it, yes, it's hard, it's complicated. But as a local news org, if you are doing your job, you are probably right now reporting on veterans who are not getting their medicine in a timely fashion because of delays right. in the postal service. You may have done the post postal box removal story in your community. Those are important and real stories. At the same time, we have to recognize there is, there is an agenda behind undercutting trust in institutions that we rely on to give us confidence in the vote. And so that has to become a regular part of the editorial conversation. And then it has to be transparently included in the report. Uh, Josh, did you want to add anything or? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think you, you just got to hold your local election officials accountable. You know, typically in a, in a on election night, we get a lot of exit polling, right? Um, and we, we traditionally use exit polling as a way to determine uh, how voter sentiment. But I think, you know, this year it's going to be different uh, because of COVID. And so I think the newsrooms who are smart about how they tackle that, getting voters, voters to give that information, whether it be through creating polls uh, on digital or some social mechanism, I think those are the newsrooms that are, are going to see uh, get some traction. Okay, great. Um, um, so I just, um, I just want to spend a little time just making sure, Frank, um, you had talked about first draft, you had talked about election land. If you could just um, give us a one line on each of those organizations, first draft, um, many of those are night grantees, um, but I, I just like to hear from you in a, in a very practical way how they're serving newsrooms, just so. You bet. Why don't yeah, we start so first draft? draft it, it, Sure. First Draft, I think, does a great job of, of guiding not just newsrooms, but, you know, concerned citizens to really understanding the difference between misinformation and disinformation. 
right. you know, when, when, when my aunt shares a post, you know, uh, unaware, like, oh, oh, that turns out not to be grounded in truth. That's, that's misinformation and she's amplifying. And then there, there are over efforts, coordinated, calculated disinformation efforts, which we as journalists really have to be on guard so that we don't amplify those. So uh, I think First Draft is a great resource in, in developing an editorial strategy for what is the threshold for debunking so that you don't give oxygen to rumors, and then how to fact check in a way that is responsible. Um, election land, I think, is a, is a project whose time, unfortunately, has come, which is really about monitoring what happens at polling places and, and the, the very things we all want, which is to have confidence that what takes place at the polling places is fair and equitable. Um, and the election SOS is a, is a new effort really to uh, the folks at Harkin and Democracy Fund are also involved in that to really bring the audience into the conversation and not have our communities be passive, but how can we collaborate with our communities as journalists to have them be more involved in having a trustworthy election process. Um, and then PolitiFact would be a national example. I, I would selfishly, I used to work at Tegna, a call out Verify as a local. Yeah. Uh, example uh, of just how, you know, if you as a citizen want to know, is this true? I mean, political, PolitiFact is, is a resource for anybody and is literally on demand and very topical, meaning things from yesterday are there today. Thank you. Um, of course, again, uh, many of those um, have been supported by Knight Foundation for years. Um, I just um, want to add, I want to give a share one more question from the audience and then just get final words from you. Um, um, so um, the last question that I have here is from Colette. Um, Colette is asking, how do journalists balance the need to showcase voter suppression and risks without undermining confidence in our democracy? Because it is a fine line. I'm going to give that one to you, Josh. I know that's a little, that's a heavy one. Yeah, it is. It, it is a heavy one. Um, but we all know that we are facing these issues. Um, and I think it's really important that journalists not be afraid to tackle them um, in a meaningful way that has impact uh, for their communities which they serve. And I would just implore journalists to, to, to be as diligent as possible mm -hmm. uh, when, when, you, when you have an opportunity to talk about that issue, which is voter suppression, because we know it happens. But how do we combat it? Uh, make sure that you are educating your audience um, in a meaningful way. And I think that's, that's how we tackle it here in Waco, is to have authenticity and be transparent uh, in the conversation. Excellent. And if, and if I can just oh, add yeah. to, to Josh's, course, I, I think that's course. so important. Uh, so I think it's two things. First, we should not shy away from this accountability reporting and the post office story is a good example of what the power of exposing to daylight uh, the shenanigans, if you will, uh, the power yeah. that, that journalist coverage can have. So we shouldn't shy away from those stories. I think as Colette, you know, teases out the problem there, right, is that it has the secondary effect of undermining trust in institutions, which again, there's, that serves some people's interests. So how do we as journalists uh, strike that balance? I think we wanna pair our coverage of those issues with solutions and actions. And so, for example, Josh mentioned it earlier, here's where you can drop off your mail-in ballot so right. that you, there is no issue on the return side. And so making it very transparent, easily accessible, educating people when they should expect to receive their ballot, how you can actually use mail tracking uh, to check the status of things that you should be receiving in your mail, where you can hand drop off, Actually, from an accountability standpoint, making sure the mail drop-off sites are diverse, just like we talked about, are the polling places in unequally distributed? Making sure that drop-off locations are mm -hmm. properly distributed. So pairing the problems with solutions. Wonderful. Um, we are hashtag night live. Again, we are with Josh Yuri um, at Josh E U R E on Twitter and um, at Frank Words, Frank Munjum. Um, 
And I just want to, I want to do final words really quickly and we'll wrap it up, but I'm, I'm actually going to ask you, what is the question that is keeping you up at night most about election coverage? So I want to end with your best questions, not with your answers, because this is a work in progress. So Frank, what's keeping you up at night the most? <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I, that's a great question. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know what i what i worry most i mean i in my adult life as a journalist i've never worried more for democracy than right now um and so what i worry about is that not all people who are eligible to vote will get to and not all legitimately cast votes will be counted um and and i don't have a good answer for that. Um, but all the things we've been talking about for the last half hour are, you know, best efforts, first drafts, and right. what can we do and what can we control so that we don't wind up in that situation. Um, you know, me, thank you, Josh. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I think uh, when it comes to the election, what keeps me up at night is making sure that I'm protecting uh, the community to ensure they have a voice. Uh, in the election. Uh, but then also to Frank's point is making sure that the future of our democracy is alive and well. Uh, and then cutting through the noise of this dis notion of disinformation that's just bombarding uh, our electorate on so many different levels. Um, those are the things that I, I really honestly worry about every day as we head to, and we're what, 70 days out now? Um, yeah. it's, 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 it's a daunting task. And I hope journalists uh, know they have such a pivotal role to play in this election. Mm -hmm. So please don't take it lightly. Uh, double down on what you've learned over the course of your career. Double down on that information and, and bring your best selves to work every day to make sure that this is going to be a fair election. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Frank. Um, you know, I know that journalists have, especially this year, gone from covering the pandemic and um, the economic fallout of that, and then the protests around police brutality and racial injustice. And I mean, in Miami, where uh, journalists are covering hurricanes and storms, and um, they are in Alabama, New Orleans, and Texas. Um, so, um, you know, the election is another enormous enormous thing. I, I appreciate all your contributions and I hope everybody listening is really going to think about these big questions because there really is time to, to, change, to change your plan for it to make better sense for what the pandemic will bring. Thank you. Um, please follow these gentlemen on Twitter um, and thank you for joining us. Bye thank everyone. You,